Diddy, how fast should I do these? For up to then I didn't have an idea Of what the modern world was coming to I counted 20 gas buggies going by themselves Almost every time I took a walk And then I put my ear to a bell telephone And a strange woman started in to talk What's next? What's next? Everything's up to date in Kansas City Gone about as far as they can go. They went to build the skyscraper seven stories high, about as high as a building on a grove. Everything's like a dream in Kansas City. It's better than a magic lantern show. You can turn the radiator on whenever you want the heat. With every kind of comfort, every house is all complete. You can walk the prison in the rain and never wet your feet. Really impossible to pick on any one computer magazine, be it data communications or personal computing or Byte or software news or any of the many, many, many computer magazines simply because there are so many. There are now, according to the New York Times, over a hundred computer magazines published in the United States. And on a recent trip to France, I brought back about another dozen from there. And I know that there's a lot of British computer magazines as well. And trying to look at one particular computer magazine would focus in a lot simply on one area of computers. And I think starting to take a look at the many, many magazines there are can tell us a lot about the world of computers, as well as telling us a lot about these magazines and what they're up to. Um, basically, computers come in three different sizes, mainframes, mini computers, and microcomputers. And magazines tend to aim for those three different markets. Magazines about large mainframe systems and the software on those large mainframe systems. Magazines for the mini computer market. Um, magazines for the microcomputer market. Um, within any particular market, like the mini computer market, here's a magazine called Hard Copy, um, which is focused completely on one manufacturer, digital equipment. Here's another digital equipment magazine, just focusing on digital equipment. Also in the microcomputer field, a whole magazine devoted to the Atari computer, another magazine devoted to the Atari computer. Um, we have a whole magazine devoted to TRS-80 computers, and the same thing for IBM personal computers, for um, a whole wide variety of different microcomputer manufacturers. There are computers that focus just on software applications and particular types of applications. 
Here's one that focuses just on computer graphics. Um, here's another one from France that focuses just on educational uses of microcomputers. Um, here's a magazine. I believe it's a weekly magazine that has news just of new developments in software. Also, you'll find magazines that focus both on software and hardware, but just deal with the use of computers in offices. There's these little magaz magazinelets that come out, little newsletters that come out weekly. Um, this one focuses just on data communications and tends to hit all of the hot news from Washington. Uh, and another magazine on data communications, focusing just on issues in data and data communications. Computer Business News, focusing on um, issues of interest to people who <coughs> integrators and resellers of OEM computer products. These are people who are essentially middlemen in the computer field and buy and sell halfway assembled computers and add their own labels to the front of them. Um, MIS Week is a whole other field of computers, management information systems. These aren't the computer systems for the poor word processors who were stuck down in the secretarial pool or what used to be the secretarial pool. This is information systems for management decision making, a whole magazine that focuses just on those kinds of issues. Um, then the small computer systems, I find this magazine to be one of the more amazing. It's a monthly magazine. It costs $2.95, and it sort of resembles a Sears catalog. This month's November 1982 issue has 608 pages. What do they do for 608 pages? To tell you the truth, when you open it up, odds are about 70-40 that you're going to find two facing pages of advertising or a whole page of advertising, a half page of advertising, and a half page of article. Just finding the articles um, in the magazine can take quite a bit of time. Um, but often, very, very often, the real issue of all these magazines is not the content of the articles, but the content of the advertising. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Because with, with your subscription to a lot of these magazines, for instance, this comes if you get Computer World, from time to time, you get a book of response cards. Little tear-out cards for computer products, computer software, computer hardware, computer services, um, databases, multiplexers, books on legal issues that you can tear out fill, out, fill in, and send back. Or another magazine, Data Communications, sends you these lovely little packets of the same kinds of cards. More and more junk you can buy for the computer you, solve, you bought to solve all your problems. Here are more things you can buy to solve all of the problems that the computer has caused. And a lot of these magazines, if you start looking at them, literally pop open to the pull-out cards that are inside. Again, for you to fill out and send in, subscribing to this magazine, another magazine, lots of other ma magazines, lots and lots of these kinds of cards in the back. Most of the magazines are geared much more to the subscriber I mean, to the advertiser than they are to the subscriber, and to getting lots more information than the magazine can even fit about the products and about the new developments in the computer field to the reader themselves. So you have the reader service card, 
Um, this one has up to 345 different items you can circle and send away for in the mail. And once you're lucky enough to get your name on one of these lists, believe me, you'll have a very, very full mailbox. You'll not only get ads from lots more computer magazines, you'll get ads for all kinds of seminars, training sessions, um, catalogs for computer hardware, and lots and lots of other goodies. Um, another clue to the real business of a lot of these magazines is the fact that some of them don't even cost money. They are controlled subscription magazines. Um, these exist in every field, but there are literally dozens of them in the computer field as well. You'll come across a free copy somewhere. They'll get your name from another magazine that you subscribe for, send you a couple of sample issues, and then ask you to fill out one of these free subscription cards. They get your name, your company name, and then they start asking you questions. Your major business, uh, the heading which best describes your title, and then a list. What products or services do you recommend, select, or buy? And they ask you how many computers you select or buy every year or recommend every year, how many word processing machines, how many communications machines, business machines. Depending on the magazine, they'll have this whole set of boxes for you to fill out um, so they can gather lots of data to send back to their advertisers um, to sell their advertisers the ad space or to sell their advertisers your eyes. Um, a few other questions that they ask are the number of employees or the number of students if it's a university system. Um, so again, you can fill out the form, answer all of these questions, and to tell you the truth, I've been the head of a company that buys six computers every year and has hundreds of employees, and that's how I wind up with a lot of these magazines. Um, but I think a lot of the magazines and a lot of the publications here you know, are totally geared at selling the hardware, not to the, not to the person very often who's the end user, but to the, but to the person who is giving them to a lot of people to work on, a lot of word processors, a lot of secretaries, a lot of office managers are making these kinds of decisions. Um, We'll take a look later at some of the ads for some of these products, but in the meantime, let's take a look at a Nikosh slideshow, which raises some of the questions from the point of view of the real users of a lot of the systems. Everybody's excited, everybody plays with it, but once you're on it, and once you're steadily putting in copy or whatever you're doing on it for two or three hours, it can be annoying. Your eyes, your head, fatigue, tiredness. The video display terminal is turning the office into an industrial workplace. Our work is more boring, routine, and highly supervised. And we used to think we were exempt from occupational hazards. Now we go home feeling sick and irritable, and we worry about the possible hazard of radiation from the new machines. The VDT, which you may know as the cathode ray tube, or CRT, could make our work easier and less tedious. But the VDT was developed to increase productivity. It was designed with little concern for our comfort and health. And we've begun to realize that the headaches, the eye strain, the back pain, and the tension are not our individual health problems. I did have eye strain because I was working for approximately six hours a day at the machine. They were irritated, very red. Uh, I couldn't read very well, and uh, they hurt. Well, my eyes certainly have deteriorated in seven years of using them, and I suspect that that's probably a cause. My eyes, I noticed last year, weren't too good, and I usually don't have eyeglass until um, 
two, every two years, but now I've been going every one year. You know, one, within one year, I've been going. My eyes have changed. Five years ago, I went to an eye doctor in a panic and said, you know, my eyes hurt all the time. I can't watch television when I go home at night. And he said there was nothing wrong. About six months ago, I went back, and he said, oh, yes, you need special glasses for your job. I said, why didn't you tell me that five years ago? He said, we didn't know anything about it then. I wore contact lenses, and I discovered I could no longer wear my contact lenses at work, working on the BBTs. I would put my contact lenses in at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. By 11 o'clock, my eyes were so dry, I couldn't keep them in. I mean, they were just pain. My problem was I began to feel irritated more than anything else. One lady that I told you about, she has a headache every night when she leaves. Every night. Well, as I say, I noticed the backache, the, just the physical strain of sitting on the machine. And then I noticed, and I couldn't prove it, I noticed that workers were more quarrelsome, more apt to bicker, more, more personality conflicts. And I said, this has to do with the work. It can't possibly be that 12 people hired at random from outside, brought into a company on the same time, the same day, could all happen to have short tempers. VDTs may emit low, but potentially dangerous levels of radiation, including x-rays, microwaves, ultraviolet, and infrared light. More testing is needed to find out what level of radiation is given off by the machines. There is no safe level, so even a low dose can be hazardous especially when so many of us work so many hours on VDTs. How many hours do you sit at the machine? On average, six or 30 a week. And I spend eight hours a day or more if there's overtime on the VDTs. And on a given day, we can sit in front of one of those screens for nine hours at a clip. It used to be where I could, I could take ads all day on a typewriter. But on a VDT, you have to take a break. I mean, you have to. We face a combination of things. Incorrect lighting, bad machine design, poor office layout, lack of maintenance, and long hours at the machine that put a constant strain on each of us. Light sources, noise sources, glare sources, and everything else were just put into a room that has VDT operators and non-VDT operators so that the VDT operators have to suffer with all kinds of uh, glare and noise and distraction conditions that make you get tense in order to concentrate, and especially in a job like copy editing. Uh, the desks are not adjustable. We have overhead lighting. We're on the 39th floor, which gives us a marvelous view of Central Park, which, of course, we can't enjoy. So you have to keep the blinds down all day long, or else you have tremendous glare. Uh, we have both direct and reflected glare. We're starting to get detachable keyboards. Paper stands. No such thing. You put the paper on your desk and you type it in. Chairs with backrests, forget it. Our chairs go way back like this. Periodic eye exams, no such thing. Regular cleaning and maintenance of VDTs. It's hysterical. The way they're cleaned is you lift the screen about once every six months and you blow it out. So half the office is covered in soot. I don't even think our terminals are inspected. I mean, I don't think they've been inspected since they were put in. And we've had them almost two years already. The job is a stressful job. And I think the stress is added to by the fact that the machines were installed without real consideration of environment for an operator. These problems can be corrected. Screens can be installed that reduce the glare from windows and lighting fixtures. Dimmers can be used to regulate overhead lighting. Well-designed chairs and detachable keyboards can be bought to help prevent muscle strain. Our schedules can be adjusted to allow for more break time away from the machine. The first step toward correcting these problems is to talk with our co-workers about the conditions in the office. We can come up with common demands and make sure our employers recognize the problems and agree to correct them. Many VDT operators and their unions are organizing for job safety and health. At NICOSH, the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, a group of operators and union representatives meet to discuss and coordinate efforts to improve workplace conditions. They've published a short handbook available from NICOSH for $1 that gives you detailed information and solutions to the problems we face as VDT operators. <laughs> Modern technology thinks about making money. They don't think about the future and the hazards.
You can read most of these magazines, most every issue, and entirely miss the kinds of questions and problems that these workers were talking about. This picture from an advertisement for computer systems probably gives you some sense of how the computer manufacturers really, really think of our clients or, or the ultimate users of their systems. Now, how did we get from a point when computers didn't really exist 30 years ago to from the invention of the microcomputer chip 10 years ago to the point that we're going to have 1.5 million microcomputers sold this year to the point that so many people in their everyday lives are having to deal with staring at these CRTs? Really, the story starts even before the invention of the computers with the invention of the pub tabulated punch card system that was used in the Bureau of the Census. Once in a while you'll catch a glimpse of this history in one of these magazines um, that was used in the Bureau of the Census in the 1880s. The person who developed that system for the U.S. government left, started a commercial company that went through a couple of mergers and eventually wound up being International Business Machines Company, um, which is the largest seller of computers, large-scale computers, and then many computers, and now personal computers that exist in the world. Some of the statistics on the sales of IBM, um, comparing it to a lot of its smaller competitors, um, are absolutely astonishing. It's larger than virtually all of its close competitors combined. Um, any of these, any of these companies, all of these companies, um, produce for profit, are highly competitive with each other, are pushing the state of the technology, trying to be the first to get the latest developments in the technology out to the people, out to the customers, into systems, into software, into code, into chips. But where does a lot of this development ultimately come from? You know, does it really come from their own research and development? One of the pages in one of these magazines, this one is called Electronic News, a Fairchild business newspaper, um, has a section called Government Electronics. If you want to find out what's going on with new Navy systems, new Army systems, um, new Department of Defense systems, you can look in here and there's one page in every month's issue telling you what the major contracts are. TRW Defense and Space System, $6.7 million for funding, Bell Helicopter, Hughes Aircraft, Bithrow Labs, Fairchild Republic Company, $5.7 million, Hughes Aircraft, $3.4 million, Delco Electronics, $8.6 million, GTE, Litton, Hughes, Ford, Raytheon, Singer, uh, um, Western Electric, General Dynamics, System Research Labs, American Airlines, Boeing Aerospace, all for development of new electronics, um, computers and communication systems. Um, this is where the cutting edge development takes place. You won't even see in here any great detail in terms of what these contracts are for. Um, but those of you who are waiting to buy your microcomputer because the computer magazines are always promising you new and better models that are under development, those of you who are waiting to buy your microcomputer till a new chip comes out can rest very, very assured that there will be better and faster microchips available for you soon. The Department of Defense needs better and faster microchips to guide its guided missiles. And a, new, a whole new program is being undertaken um, to bring you ultimately popping out of the end of this long tube from de Defense Department laboratories um, to Byte magazine, um, you will eventually get even faster, even better chips. You can look at some of the articles that are published in this magazine. Let's see if we can find this article about Taiwan that's in here.
Oh, no, I lost it. Um, this magazine can manage to publish an article about Taiwan that mentions all of the big companies that have plants in Taiwan, um, when they started business, how they started business, um, what they're doing now, and managed to put in pictures of happy-looking engineers sitting at their assembly plants, um, ministers, salesmen, technicians, and never once mention the fact, here we are in a computer store. Uh, they never once mention the fact um, that this isn't really increasing the development in Taiwan, that this isn't really um, adding to the wealth or knowledge in Taiwan, that the majority of jobs that they're actually creating are jobs for low-skilled young women who are chosen because they're very, very docile, who have fairly good finger dexterity, who sit for the six to eight to ten years that their working life lasts, staring into microscopes, um, welding together the microcircuitry that makes all of this possible. Um, I didn't see a picture, I didn't see a word. All it talks about is the great and wonderful industry and how wonderful it has been um, for booming Taiwan.